Um, we left off on lecture number two. I'm going to go a little bit back here. We left off, uh, well, we started in the biblical foundation uh, side of it, and we talked about, um, we initially began to talk about the scriptures here of Exodus chapter 19, um, and then John chapter 14. And so what we'll do now is that we're going to continue on the book of Acts 2.42, and then we'll talk about Ephesians 5.24 through 32. So as we go here, we talked about how the importance of our central claim in Zion Assembly is that uh, Christ is the way, he is our truth, and he's our life. But now... Um, Let's look at uh, John 14, and I'm sorry, not Acts. We'll start in John 14, John 14, verse 8. And here we have, again, the conversation that was taking place between um, Jesus and uh, Philip. And the Bible says, uh, reading from the King James uh, uh, translation here, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the father and it suffice us so as we read this here we can see then that there is a clear vision of jesus and his work that needs to take place here so john 14 and 8 the word seen is hero heroaka heroaka i hope i'm pronouncing this right in, in greek which in the perfect tense of horao which means to see or to perceive so Philip is speaking to Jesus, and Philip is telling him, he's saying, Jesus, hey, we, 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 we know about you, but show us who the Father is, and that'll be enough for us. I don't know if Philip was speaking probably in a spiritual sense or show us physically, but I believe that Philip was trying to say, we want to see physically, show us the Father physically. But listen to what Jesus tells him. Jesus, remember, he answers him. He says, hey, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So the perfect tense here indicates a completed action with ongoing results. So what does this suggest for us? That anyone who has seen Jesus has an ongoing understanding of the Father. So remember, this is why Jesus said, nobody comes to the Father but through me, through him. So that's our part of the biblical foundation of the introduction of um, the abstract of faith. And remember, we're just talking about the introduction of the abstract of faith. So what is the overall view of John 14, 6 and 8? Because remember, we left off on John 14, verse 6 and, and verse 8. What is the overall theme or the emphasis on these verses is that the unique and central role of Jesus in Zion Assembly as the only way to know and have a relationship with God. So the idea that Jesus is a perfect reflection of the Father so that to see Jesus then in these terms is to see God the Father. Because remember, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So to see Jesus, it also means to see the Father. And what does it mean to see the Father? It means to that design assembly, we're here because we want to perceive, we want to understand what the what God's program is. And what is God's program? It was to bring Jesus to give us redemption, to free us from the from sin and, and return us to the, the state that we were with the Father, but to also, while at the same time doing this, come together and bring into one God's children, into one nation, one church. So that's the overall view we can say of John 14, verses 6 and 8. Now, what about Acts? We'll study the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 42. So if I go back to where we started on the biblical foundation of Zion Assembly, we read that the following scriptures form the biblical foundation of Zion Assembly's commitment to do what? To accept and obey the teachings of Christ and his apostles. So we talked about the book of Acts. We talked about John 14, 6 and 8. And now we're going to look at 
Acts chapter 2. I'm sorry, not the book of Acts. We talked about Exodus first, John, and now Acts chapter 2, verse 42. So this is where lecture 3 will, uh, we can say, will kick off here. So as we go here, we'll see here in the King James translation, it says, and it's talking about the church, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And not just the doctrine. So we're going to see three, uh, we're going to see four things here. We'll see here that Acts 2.42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread. So we see doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayers. It, it, look at this. This is amazing here. We see doctrine first, talking about the teachings. We see fellowship talking about the covenant relationship we can say that we've taken to become members of the body of Christ. We see the breaking of bread, which is uh, an example for us of the sacraments in the church. Uh, for example, the Lord's Supper, the, the washing of the saints' feet. Uh, and then we see prayers, which is the continued action behind everything that we're doing. So just in Acts 2.42, we see a complete picture of the church and this is so beautiful when we see the complete picture of the church in acts 242 then we come to understand that in zion assembly our biblical foundation is based on also acts 242 because we want to have a complete picture of the way the church is supposed to function in doctrine in fellowship in breaking of bread and in prayers you know when we see the word breaking of bread automatically of course, you know, we think about food and, and the custom during that time was that they would have the Lord's Supper and then there would also be supper that was served. So it would also they would also continue in fellowship. But you remember that there came a time period that um, instead of focusing on the Lord's Supper, they just focused on on, on fellowship, on eating and, and, and just having a, a good old time. And I remember that Paul tells him that they needed to go back to the main focus of what it was to really uh, practice the, the sacraments of what Christ had left the church. So for the biblical foundation here, we're looking at Acts 2.42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Now, let's, let's look at this here. What does this mean? What does Acts 2.42 mean? It means that this is our commitment of continuation. What does continuation in the sense of this word mean here? It means restoration. So the Bible says that they continued steadfastly. In Greek, that's the, that's the word proskatero. So it means what? And you see that it means that they persevered, they were persistent, and they devoted themselves to something. What did they devote themselves to? To the doctrine. What else? To fellowship. What else? To the breaking of bread. What else? To prayer. So when we look at the New Testament church, they devoted themselves to these four important things. That should speak volumes to us today in Zion Assembly, that this should be the same continued uh, or continuation or commitment of continuation for us. This is why when we look at uh, the church today, we are a, in a sense, a restoration movement. What does that mean? That we are, in a sense, want to be committed to continue to restore uh, everything that the church had in its glory when it was organized by Christ and the promises that have been placed on the church from the beginning. So their devotion was because they were what? They were eyewitnesses. So the, the, uh, the early church was full of eyewitnesses. Remember when Jesus Christ resurrected, the Bible says that he appeared to uh, uh, about 500 or more witnesses. So there was many, many witnesses that we don't hear of their accounts in the Bible. We just hear of the number, but there's many. I, I imagine that there was thousands that were witnesses of this. And this witnessing or this eyewitness caused them to have a devotion for Christ. And what was the devotion that led them? It led them to continue committed to the word. So here it is. You and I today are also eyewitnesses. 
You and I today are also eyewitnesses. How, how are we eyewitnesses? Not in the sense that uh, we have seen Jesus physically, because we haven't. But we are eyewitnesses to the resurrection in what sense? Because of what Christ has done in our lives. And many of us could spend hours testifying uh, from the beginning of your life to where you're at today, how we have been eyewitnesses to Christ in our lives. But when we devote this or we or we use this in a sense to talk about the biblical foundation of Zion Assembly, first thing that comes to mind is that Zion Assembly Church of God is a restoration movement. A lot of people, when they see that, they go, wait a minute, what do you what do you mean you're a movement? It we're using that word here or that term movement, not in the way that it's being used today in the denominational system. We're using the, the word movement here to describe a continued action. So when we say that Zion Assembly is a restoration movement, it means that we have committed ourselves to restoring primitive Christianity. What is, what is our desire in the church today? To return to the roots of Christianity, and not only to the roots, but to recapture what? recapture the simplicity and the purity of the early church. So let's focus on those words there. Returning to the roots. What do the roots do to a tree? The roots do to a tree what uh, what the word of God can do to us. It firmly holds us together. So as we study the scripture here, and we see in the introduction of the abstract of faith, this scripture in the book of Acts is being used as part of our biblical foundation. So as we see this, then we can understand why Zion Assembly is a restoration movement, because our desire is to go back to the roots, because only in the roots will we find something that will hold us together without moving us. Remember the scripture that says that I um, the scripture that describes a person being like a tree planted by the rivers of water. What does the rivers of water do to that tree that is planted by it? It gives it life. It gives it uh, it gives it water to to make its roots stronger. And it just it gives the tree life to never be removed from where it's placed. So what is it? What is this telling us? That in Zion Assembly, our desire is not only to return to the roots of Christianity, but at the same time as we return, we recapture, and I love this word, the simplicity of what? Of the gospel. The simplicity of the message of the church. That is what? To gather all of God's children into one fold. The simplicity and then the purity of the early church. That doesn't mean that the early church was perfect because the church hasn't reached perfection yet. That meant simply that the church knew that to live holy was to live a life separated only for God's work. And what does this do? The restoration movement helps us to bring about a calling of all people back to primitive Christianity. Now, I know that word primitive today, when you look at it, automatically people think caveman. <laughs> they think of people living in caves. And, and no, when we're talking about primitive Christianity, we're talking about going back um, to the established teachings that were that were taught to the apostles and that they received through divine revelation and that they passed on to their disciples and then their disciples passed it on to us. And today in the church, this is why we are a we are judis, judicial only. What does that mean? That we search out the laws of Christ, the teachings of Christ, and we practice them. We don't make the laws. We don't make the rules. You know, uh, this is why in the church it's very unique the way the church functions because um, we don't have private interpretations. Individuals don't interpret the Bible privately and begin to teach. We have a multitude of counselors in the, the general assembly is the multitude of counselors. And in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. 
This is why government in the church is very, very important because government keeps us on the right track. And this is why sometimes it's very important also to submit to one another in love, to submit to one another because we are looking for the good of the church. So Zion Assembly being a restoration movement is to return to the roots of Christianity, recapture the simplicity of the early church, bring about a calling of all people back to primitive Christianity, and then the church of God has been called to return to the old paths. I know that we've heard that for so long. We've heard people preach about it. But what is the old paths? So the church has been called to go back to the old path. What does it mean to return to the old paths? Now, the phrase old paths comes from the book of Jeremiah. Remember the prophet Jeremiah in the Old Testament. And the prophet Jeremiah urges the people of Israel. He urges the people of God to return to the ancient paths, because that's what old means, ancient. Return to the ancient path to walk in the ways of their ancestors. What, is that, what does that mean? If, if you were with us in Pulaski last uh, two weeks ago when we preached about the word of God being lost in the house of God, the, the Bible presents to us King Josiah coming into power to be king around the age of eight. And then it begins to tell us that he be, he began to, and I'm going to just paraphrase some of these words, he began to search out or to, to follow in the ways of his father David. And what does that mean? That meant simply that he went back to primitive uh, teachings, primitive understanding, primitive beliefs of David who believed in God and believed in God's laws. So when Jeremiah calls the people of Israel and he urges them to go back to the old paths, he's saying, in other words, go back to the ways of their ancestors. And that calling is for us today also. In a religious context, returning to the old paths can mean rejecting modern innovations and trends in favor of what? Biblical practices and beliefs. So to go back to the old paths in the church means that we are not going to be persuaded by modern innovations or trends. You know, we live in a time of trends. And for ministries, ministries to grow today, they're being directed as businesses. Now, I, I'm not saying that there aren't... Um, there aren't factors in ministry that we have to work as administrators, of course, but we cannot um, focus so much on the administrative side that we forget the biblical side. It's so important to us. Remember when, when the apostles in the New Testament um, were given the opportunity to choose deacons, and they said the deacons will serve the tables. In other words, they will help us to do this, and then the apostle says, and we will we will uh, we will just work on our teaching ministry, our preaching ministry, because they understood the balance that had to exist with both of them. But in a religious context, to return to the old paths is to reject those modern innovations, those trends in favor of what biblical practices and beliefs. Now, it also involves a rejection of denominational divisions, and what does it do? It calls for unity among all believers. You know, a brother once told me a while back, he said, brother, speaking of the organization that he's in, he said, we've become so exclusive that we have excluded everyone else. And it's true. This can happen to a lot of us when we begin to think so much of who we are as God's people or God's church that we begin to exclude everybody else. But the Bible calls for us to preach on a unity that must take place among all of God's children. So what does it mean to return back to the old paths? It means to walk in the ways of our ancestors. In other words, walk in the ways, not of people, but walk in the teachings that have been laid down for us through the apostles that they received from Jesus. Now, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 24 through 32. This is, 
quite a few scriptures here. I'm going to read them real quick here. We're talking about our biblical foundation. So we talked about a book of Acts. Now we're going to go to the last scripture here. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. To do what? That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. But then Paul says, this is a great mystery. And then Paul tells us, he's really not speaking about marriage, he says, even though we can use it. We can use it to help us. But Paul says, I speak concerning Christ and the church. Listen to this. So how can we apply Ephesians 5, 24, 32? How can we apply this to us in Zion Assembly, Church of God? How can we do this? Number one, by submitting to Christ. So what does the church do? The church submits to Christ's leadership. So very important. The church submits to Christ's leadership, just as the wives are called to submit to their husband's leadership, so the church is called to submit to Christ's leadership. Christ is the head of the church, and the church is to follow his guidance and direction. How do we do this in Zion Assembly? By submitting to his word, by submitting to his guidance, by submitting to the government structure that God has provided for the church. This is what we're all about in Zion Assembly. We are here to submit to Christ's leadership. How else can we do this? Let's see here. I'm going to move this out the way here. How else can we do this? By sacrificial love. I love this here. It says Christ loves the church sacrificially. What does that mean? That husbands are called to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. The same way Christ loved the church, sacrificially by laying down his life for her, this sacrificial love is a model for how the church should love one another and serve others. Why? Because when we practice this sacrificial love in the church, we're going to see that whatever we do and however we act and the way we talk and what we do is going to be for the good of our brother and sister because we are caring for their soul. And even if we haven't offended nobody or that person, we go and we ask for forgiveness and many times. Why? Because we care for that person's soul and we don't desire for that person to be lost and go to hell. Why? Because we love them. That's part of the sacrificial love that's in the church. That's part of what Paul is saying in the book of Ephesians. So how can Zion Assembly apply this? First, by submitting to Christ. Number two, by sacrificial love. And number three, by being united with Christ. What does that mean? The church is united with Christ. In Ephesians 5.30, Paul writes that we are members of his body. So this emphasizes the idea that the church is united with Christ in a profound and intimate way. In other words, we know who Christ is and Christ knows who we are. And remember, that takes us back to what Jesus told Peter. And, and Peter said, you are the son of the living God. And, and Peter and, and Jesus looks at Peter and he said, well, you're the son, uh, you're, you're, uh, you're Peter. Um, uh, and he says, and upon this rock, upon this mutual understanding, upon this divine revelation, I'm going to build my church. So just as a husband and wife become one flesh in marriage, so the church is united with Christ and shares in his life. Now, we do this by submitting to Christ, by sacrificial love, 
by being united with Christ. And last, by reflecting Christ's love. By reflecting Christ's love. And we're going to conclude here today. That the church reflects Christ's love to the world. How? Ephesians 5.32, Paul describes marriage as a mystery. It reflects the relationship between Christ and the church in the same way the church is called to reflect Christ's love and character. Listen to this. Not just his love, but his character. You know, we can talk about his love all the time, but what is his character? It's action. It's taking action to what we're saying, backing up our words. If we say we have the love of Christ in Zion Assembly, let us show the character of what the love of Christ is in Zion Assembly to the world, to others. And to the point where if our brother's from another church, we're going to love our brother, even if he's from another church. There should be nothing in us that separates us from our brothers and sisters. And when it comes to teaching doctrine, and holding firm to the word, we will stand firm to the word. You can't, that doesn't mean you're going to come promise the word of God either. So Christ is love and character to the world, showing the world what God's love looks like in action. So what is he saying here? The church is called to reflect Christ's love and his character. Why? Because we are the body of Christ. We are the representative of Christ. We are to demonstrate that love today. So we're going to end here, lecture three, on reflecting Christ's love.